Comrades, <coughs> friends, just by way of introduction, I will introduce myself. Um, there have been many descriptions of what I am, who I am, where I came from, and probably where I'm going. Well, for the record, I joined the National Union of Mine Workers on day one of my employment at the age of 15. I also joined the Young Communist League because I wanted to see a change in society. I was fed up even at that tender age of having to endure a society where politicians simply wanted to ameliorate the problems that we faced. Whether it's education, the National Health Service, care for the elderly, privatisation, or a whole ro range of things, including employment, wages, and terms and conditions. All too often, we have people who want to see a short-term success by saying, all right, don't sack a thousand people. If you only sack uh, 600, we've won a victory. Not in my book. In my book, not one human being should be discriminated against, and not one human being should have to endure any hardship in a so-called civilized society. Now, it's not often, John, that I've been asked to speak about four different subjects on one night, <coughs> but I'll do my best. And could I start by something I usually end with? It's a quote. As relevant today as where it was made, the desire of one man to live on the fruits of another's labour is the original sin of the world. It is this sin which has produced a record of crime and calamity throughout mankind. It is in fact the parent injustice from which all injustice springs. That was said by Brontiri O'Brien on the 27th of April 1833. It's as relevant today as the day he said it. The desire of one person to live on the fruits of another. You can see it in America with this crackpot that they've elected as president. You can see it in Parliament with the right-wing Tory government. You can see it with that that represents social democracy, the Labour Party, who don't know whether they're coming to the left, to the right, to the centre, or backwards. Look, for example, at the European Union. For at least 60 years of my life, I have opposed the whole concept of a European Union. Before that, during that, the European Common Market. Don't forget that the advocates who are now being presented on television, both from the Tory government, right-wing organisations like UKIP, only started to talk about the EEC and the European Union in the 1990s, before Farage left the Tory party, before he left his job in the city of London. One of those who Brontiri O'Brien was talking about in 1833. My opposition is based upon class. I'm not from an academic background, although yes, I, I did do some studying <coughs> on a part-time basis. But for 20 years of my life, I worked as a coal miner. 
underground at one colliery. And it was during that time that on one Saturday afternoon in February 1972, I was asked as the spokesperson and the leader of picketing in the Yorkshire area of the NUM if I would organise some pickets to come to picket a coke implant in a place called Birmingham. I thought at first it was some kind of a joke. A coke implant. Now we have coke implants in Yorkshire. They usually stock around 40 tonnes of coal or coke. The small, small businesses. Never anticipated in my life that it was any more than that. But I was asked to send as many people as we could because they were having real trouble trying to deal with the situation which had erupted in Birmingham. I'd never been to Birmingham in my life. On a Saturday afternoon, I had to organise miners to come down to Birmingham. Within the space of three hours, we had eight coach loads of around 52 people per coach en route for Birmingham. Our only direction was a place called the Star Social Club, the headquarters of the Communist Party. That was the meeting point. I said, well, where is it? And this voice said, an old friend of mine said, I'll tell you where it is, sir. I said, near the bullring. Ask for the bullring, can't go wrong. <laughs> so we set off these miners. And something suddenly struck me. I will never know, no matter when my term on this planet comes to an end, what it was or why it was. But something told me that something different was at stake. And I decided that I needed to go. And so along with another colleague, we jumped in a car and followed the route of the coaches. The first thing that occurred was I ran into a great big open ground. There were buses all over the place. I thought for a moment there were hours. And then I noticed that the uniforms were slightly different to the jeans and the coats of miners. There were police uniforms. But I thought, well, if you're in difficulty, ask a policeman. <laughs> So I said, could you tell me where the Star Social Club is? Oh, I said, I'm no tidy boy. I'm from South Wales. No idea where it is. Don't know Birmingham. Best if you go into the centre. I said, thank you very much. I thought, there's something strange here. There were hundreds of them. I arrived at the Star Social Club eventually. And I met Frank Waters, an old friend of mine, a mentor of mine, and Maura Simmons, secretary of the Labour Party. But I was also to discover other contacts within the city. But the first job was to organise accommodation. Where do you put up hundreds of miners? in the second largest city in Britain. We put out a call all over Birmingham. 
And I tell you, you would never believe it. There were people coming from all walks of life. Can we have a minor? And some of the lads, you know, were very stoic. We had two young men, similar age to some of the young lads here. We're all right, Arthur. We don't need to go. This lovely old couple wanted to take them. We're okay, but the lads wanted a drink, you know. And suddenly two, two young people came in and said, we can put up two minors. And I nearly got knocked down in the rush. <laughs> These two young attractive girls from the University of Birmingham were willing to put up two minors. These two young lads said, we could do with a bed. <laughs> I said, on one condition, you're on that picket line, on the dot, all four of you, not two. And they agreed. We were then told, by this time it was 2 a.m. in the morning, on a Sunday, didn't start on the 10th, started on the previous Sunday. By Sunday morning we were told we would have to be at Saltley. Didn't even know where it was. By 6 a.m. Someone said, they'll not be delivering coke on a, on a Sunday. But they were. We got down there and there were hundreds of police. But of course, by this time, there were hundreds of miners. And a battle royal took place. Yes, we were under attack. And in the forerunners of what would to become the riot gang, there were police dressed in motorbike uniforms with helmets and almost protective gear. But of course we had weight of numbers and we battled and we wouldn't let through those lorries by sheer force. By 10 o'clock they abandoned the attempt and they closed the gates at Saltley on the Sunday. And the lads said, there you are, we've done it. I said, no, we haven't. It's what's called a ceasefire. They'll be back, and they'll be back in numbers. Don't forget, there were hundreds of lorries every day coming to this coking plant. And I recognised immediately the reason why. It was a miniature Mount Everest of coke. I've never seen as much coke or coal in my life. It was our job to stop it and to redirect it. Because we didn't just want to stop it. We wanted that coke or coal to go to hospitals to schools, to the care for the elderly, those in need, and not to factories, and not to production. The next morning, on the Monday, one had to be there to witness how many police were there. <coughs> the battles that raged engaged the entire nation. Hour by hour, people were witnessing what was taking place. I even had the temerity to go on television and say, stop giving us mere support. Get yourselves down here to Saltley in Birmingham and stop these people going in, the scab lorry drivers. They came. But of course it wasn't enough. We were getting battered. I actually got arrested. And they carted me off to a police station. It's the only time in my life 
I've been arrested and released. <laughs> and the reason was simple. There were 400 pickets surrounding the pit police station, threatening to turn it over. And I can tell you the name of the police officer. They called him Brannigan. And he said, I wonder if you could do us a favour. Forgive the accent, I'm sorry. I used to be good at it. He said, you can go if you can get the pickets away. I said, that's no problem. Right, he said, y you're released. I've been arrested and released in an hour. But I got a job, I got to disperse them. So I dispersed them back to the picket line. And there we were, battling away. A lot of people getting injured, kicked around. People there from all walks of life helping us. I met people I'd never heard of before, like Alan Law, who was the leader of the Transport and General Workers Union. Nicky Bridge, the chairman with whom I stayed for the entire week of that amazing week. And of course, I met also the leaders of the engineering union in the Birmingham East District. And it was clear to me that the miners alone could not achieve total success in closing this plant. And on the Tuesday night, it was arranged that I should address a meeting at the headquarters in the Bullring. I certainly knew where the Bullring was now. And I addressed this meeting. Yes, he was a 34-year-old miner, speaking with all the passion that I could muster, telling them what we were going through. And our objective was as simple as ABC. We were fighting for a decent living wage, for working in the bowels of the earth. And for that, we were being battered to bits in the centre of the biggest town outside of London. I said, I've come here tonight and I'm not asking anyone for a donation. We don't want your sympathy. We don't want some kind of support by way of a donation. I said, I want you on strike. I said, you've got a chance. You can go one way or you can go the other. You can either ignore the plea I make and it will go down in history as a non-event. I said, but on the other hand, you can support us physically by going on strike and you can write yourselves into history. And the right wing leader of that trade union stood up and said, brothers, I propose that we postpone any decision for a week, consult our members, and then we can come to a decision. And I said to Arthur Harper, big lad, barrel chested, who was chairing the meeting, I said, not enough. It's got to be this Thursday. And he said, okay. He says, there's only one man I'm worried about. The tall block at the, mat at the back. I said, why? And he's whispering this on the platform. He says he's always, always opposed any industrial action. And I'm just worried about it. I said, well, they've got a chance to vote one way or the other. And so
So Arthur Harper said, you've heard what Brother Scargill has said. He's asking you for support. Physical support. Strike action. All those in favour. And the hands went up like a forest. And then this man's hand went up as the hands went down. And I thought, I'm ready for the question. He says, oh, I've got one question for you. And I'm ready to answer him. I says, yes. He says, what time do you want is there? The platform was as confused as I was. And it was all after the meeting. I learned his four brothers were miners and they were all on strike. And so the scene was set. On Wednesday the battle took place normally. <laughs> it was fierce. Yes, it was bloody. Never mind what the statistics tell you. Well over a hundred miners were hurt. Over a hundred were arrested. We were certainly being battered. And on the Thursday morning, I was beginning to wonder how long, how much longer could we last? Because we fight to the end. We went, we went to that picket line. There were masses of police. And there were thousands of miners and supporters. But there was one thing different. It took me a while to understand it. There wasn't a thing moving. In the second largest city in Britain, there wasn't a bus, there wasn't a lorry, there wasn't a car moving. Nothing. It looked like a dead zone. You could see on the police faces a look of apprehension, concern, worry. And for a moment, I, I couldn't understand it. And suddenly, not from two directions, from five different directions, there were thousands of Birmingham workers coming to support the miners in struggle. As long as I live, I can never convey to you the pride, the emotion, and the power of what I saw and what I felt. They were coming and they were demanding the rights of workers to strike and to fight. They were coming alongside us. And I heard the chief constable say, no matter what we do, make sure that they go straight past. And I jumped straight into the middle of this arena and said, stop. Don't anyone move from this area. And they didn't. There were men and there were women, hundreds of women from different factories. They were coming like a sandwich, blocking the, the whole area. And the police didn't know what the hell to do. They were in a complete deadlock. And finally, I asked them to do one thing. Because they were chanting all sorts of things. General strike, support the miners, do this, do that. And I started the chant, close the gates, close the gates. And every time we said it, the crowd moved forward. The police ranks couldn't resist physically. They were going pushed back to the gates. The gates would have been ripped off 
that something not taking place. And Kappa, the chief constable, said, close the gates. And he said, we'll close them and we'll agree to close them permanently. I said, on one condition, you sign an agreement that no more coke goes out of this depot. And he agreed. And so did the chairman of the gas board. He said, would you do us a favour? Would you please now dis disperse the crowd? We've closed it permanently. And I said, yes. On two conditions. One, that I can make a speech. And two, I can use your equipment because mine's knackered. <laughs> and they gave me the police megaphone. It was an electric megaphone. And I spoke from the top of the urinal. And I told the workers, the people of Birmingham, what they had achieved from all works of life, from every religion, from every creed, from every ethnic background. They were there as one. Miners for the first time in their lives understood and began to understand that workers of whatever colour, whatever creed, whatever nationality, were no different from what we were. We were in common struggle. That's what won the battle of Salt Lake. That's what made it an epoch-making event that even today it's echoed round the world by workers who've learnt it, seen it on television, seen it on the internet, <clears throat> because it was such a momentous decision that workers took in Birmingham. I will never forget for the rest of my life, not only the impact it had on me, but on the impact that it had on the working class of this country and the working class of the world. We had support pouring in from America, from Cuba, from Southeast Asia, from the continent, supporting us because they understood. And of course, a similar situation took place at Orgreave in South Yorkshire years later in 1984. And again, it didn't simply take place on the 18th of June when the scenes that you've seen on television were so graphic. It started ironically on the previous Sunday on a bank holiday, almost a replica of what took place at Salt Lake. But more important, the mass picketing on that day closed the plant, just as it had at Salt Lake all those years before. The difference was very simple. On the 27th of <coughs> May, I got knocked unconscious. The police said, I quote, Mr. Scargill slipped on a sleeper. Two minutes later, they changed the story. They said, Mr. Scargill must have run into a post. And finally, they said, he must have got knocked down by some of his own colleagues as they rushed to get away. One thing they forgot or didn't know. All photographers, all cameramen, all television crews have been kept back. There was no photographic evidence of what had taken place when I got knocked down. 
I remember the late Paul Foote, the columnist on the Daily Mirror, and an outstanding socialist. He wanted to do a story on it. And he came down to interview the witnesses. And Paul Foote, and those who knew him would remember, in his inevitable way said, you know, the problem is, um, it's a pity that we haven't got a photograph of the actual event, you know. That's, that's what we really need. And this lad said, uh, I've got one. And yes, he said, but you don't understand. I'm talking about a contemporaneous photograph. This lad said, well, I've got one at a time. He says, I mean, when Mr. Scargo got knocked down, I says, I took a photograph. He says, it were all right, wasn't it? So Paul Foot says, could, could you get it developed? He said, to the Daily Mirror photographer, could, could you go with him? Could we have it developed? He said, well, I had it developed. He said, can you go and fetch it? He said, well, there's no need, I've got it. He says, can we look at it? He said, yeah. He got four. There was a miner called Arthur Wakefield. He looked, Paul Fulton looked at these photographs, showing clearly that I'd been hit by a policeman's riot shield on the back of the head. He says, why didn't you publish them? He said, I didn't think they were good quality. Yeah. Well, at least on that occasion, the mirror did publish them. And then the organization of Orgrief took place. Not in a day, but over a period of time. Inside the movement, inside the left of the NUM, we had to fight to try and convince even people who were progressive of the need to picket at the steel plants at Ravenscray in Scotland, in Port Talbot in Wales, at Flamwern in Newport, and of course above all at Scunthorpe, which was serviced by Orgreave. Why? Why would we want to picket steel plants? All these academics are having to rewrite the books. All these so-called expert journalists are having to rethink. Because it wasn't about the stockpiles in the power stations. The steel plants have only got a limited amount of space. And the total amount of space could only last six weeks. The strike started on the 12th of March, 1984. And just in case, and there's always a chance, that someone from the MI5 is in this room, just in case they want it spelling out to them, count forward six weeks from the 12th of March, and you'll find yourself on the 18th of June. It was the ideal opportunity to challenge. Yes, and we couldn't have won. On that day, we had miners from all over Britain pouring in. Thousands of them. On a conservative estimate, 15,000 on a more liberal basis, 20,000. By the way, there were 8,200 riot police from all over Britain. Many of them were armed forces in police uniform. And miners fought bravely against all odds. We had these riot police armed with staves with riot shields, long, medium and short, 
like Roman gladiators, but without the guts. The truncheons, the horses were there, the dogs were there. They were setting the dogs onto people. And we got miners in t-shirts and jeans and plimsolls facing them and battering them back. And all the hell are they to tell me that miners had no right to fight when they're being attacked like they were being attacked. I'll tell you this, if workers are under attack, you fight back, you don't give in. And that's what we did on the 18th of June. What happened was this, in the afternoon of that day, after I was carried away, hospitalized or arrested, I pleaded with the area leaders of the NUM to intensify the picketing for reasons, shall we say, unknown to me. They decided not to do that, but to pull the picketing off and send the pickets into Nottingham and send the pickets to the pits in that area. A fundamental mistake in my view. It wasn't there that we were going to win or lose. It was at Orgreave we were going to win or lose. On that afternoon, on the 18th of June, 1984, Sir Robert Haslam, the chairman of British Steel, sent a telex, I know because I've got it, closing the plant at Orgreave. Exactly the same as the closure of the gates on the Sunday in Saltley in 1972. The difference was fundamental. Unlike Saltley in 1972, when the picketing was increased and workers from all ranks came, at Orgreave, the picketing was scaled down. And unfortunately for that vital 48 hours, I was lying in a hospital bed, having been knocked unconscious by a policeman's shield. Or was it an armed officer in a policeman's outfit? But those are the facts. But the biggest tragedy of all was the betrayers in the Labour and Trade Union movement those trade union leaders in the power stations who urged their workers to cross picket lines, they were absolutely betraying every single principle of trade unionism. The treachery of people like Neil Kinnock, who was prepared to condemn miners for fighting for their rights, instead of condemning the police, and calling upon workers to take strike action. They are the guilty people. Just imagine if he had come out and said, I ask all workers to join the miners and come out on strike. The strike would have been over in days. The Tory government would have been down. Thatcher would have been gone. And the years of austerity and problems economically, socially and politically, would never have been with us. I warn then and I warn now, if what happened to workers is allowed to go unchallenged, the thing that happens to them will happen to you. You support each other. It's not my job to interfere, for example, with the dispute on Southern Rail. But if someone told me that we'll only be one union in negotiations at ACAS and not the other, <clears throat> I'd have told them to go and take a running jump into the Thames. Both unions should have gone in. 
And the demand should have been simple. Reinstate every worker that's been sacked on that railway line and take back into public ownership all the railway lines in Britain. Not one, the lot. I don't want to see piecemeal. I want to see this society take into common ownership the means of production, distribution and exchange as relevant today as when Marx first espoused it and as relevant today as when it came to fruition, whether it was in the Soviet Union or whether it was in those parts of the world where a rising took place like China. I've seen what's happened over the years and the defeat of the government's policy in the European Union ballot referendum was a victory for our class and yet the Labour leadership still haven't got it. They still don't understand the difference between the ultra-right and their reasoning and the left whose position is a class position. For example, there are four basic principles at stake. The free movement of labour, the free movement of capital, the single market and the customs union. We've got Jeremy Corbyn bleating on about the need for the single market. We should be saying, stuff your single market. I want the market of the world. Customs Union is another name for saying you can only tread with who we decide in the European Union, an unelected body. And of course, the movement of capital sounds a nice phrase, but in reality, it's simple. They can move an entire company sack its workforce and move it to Poland or Czechoslovakia or Hungary or wherever they want and they can do the same the other way around. But the movement of labour is probably the most dangerous of all because it puts worker against worker, man against man, man against woman, black against white, religion against religion. In other words, I'm an easy target. Let me make our policy clear. We are in favour of immigration. We are opposed to migration. Because it's economic migration in the interests of capitalism. I'll tell you the facts, not as they see them, and nor as they report them. Between 1950 and 2000, the population of Britain was decreasing, and yet we were having 250,000 immigrants coming into Britain. Coming from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, the West Indies, America, Canada, all over the place, they were coming in. 250,000. They had a right to come in. They were colonies of the British Empire, whose resources and labour had been exploited. And so they had and have a right to come in. But do you know how many people were going out? The number of people leaving Britain was 350,000 a year. Now, maths was never my strong suit. But I calculate that 350,000 leaving Britain and 250,000 immigrants or refugees coming in means that we've got a decrease in population. Incidentally, the birth rate had gone down to 1.8 by the year 2000. 
We had 59 million people in the year 2000. Today we've got 67 million. Where the hell have they come from? They weren't coming in between 1950 and 2000. So they can't blame people from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, the West Indies, or any other nation. So where did they come from? The answer, they were migrant labor exploited by the European Union. They were the parents of austerity, the parents of unemployment, the parents of want and need. Think about it. And look at the figures. The only figure I'm going to give you. In 2014-15, the official figures 250,000 coming in as refugees, as they'd always done, or immigrants. 350,000 leaving Britain, giving us space to accept asylum seekers and those in desperate need. But look how many came in from the European Union. Free movement, no passport, nothing. Move in. The government? Well, they don't lie, but they're pretty good liars. They said 480,000 came in from the European Union countries in 2014-2015. Well, someone's going to have to explain to me how if 480,000 came in, how was it possible to issue from the European Union 1,222,000 national insurance numbers? Over 700,000 more came in than the official figures reveal. I'll tell you where they are, shall I? They're working on zero-hour contracts. They're working as slave labor. They're working in a way and in a situation where it's beginning to put people against people. Exactly what the ruling class want and always have wanted. Incidentally, it's one of those things that really matter. When socialists examine what we should be doing, Make no mistake, the trade union movement has its responsibilities. The way that it's performed can only be described as a disgrace. Probably the worst leaderships, with a few honourable exceptions, that we've seen in a century. We know that they've always been infiltrated by agents from the state, by MI5, MI6 and CIA. The Tories have always supported strike action, provided it's in Poland, Hungary or Russia, but not here in Britain, because they practice their class politics, while I practice the politics of my 79 years. My class politics say, when workers are in struggle, you support them you don't turn your back on them. And in this current battle about the European Union, why the hell were we having the facade of a debate in Parliament about Article 50? You didn't need Article 50 as a matter of law. Ironically, even Theresa May, and she did, she said it, she said, if we do negotiations, and at the end of that, she says, no deal is better than a bad deal. Well, if that's true, you don't need Article 50. All you have to do is to tell the European Union the British people have spoken in the largest vote ever recorded. 
and we're leaving tomorrow morning. Lock, stock and barrel. That's all they needed to do. And yet they'd be running around like headless chickens. And we've still got arguments ahead. And this bunch in Parliament have got no control in the Labour Party. I'll tell you what I'd do with those who voted against. I wouldn't just sack them from the shadow cabinet. I would put every one of those on notice that they're going to be deselected at the next general election. No if, buts or whys. That's the only way you can deal with people who pretend to be members of the Labour movement in Parliament. My job tonight is a simple one. It's to blend four speeches into one. I've tried my best. All my life, I fought for the socialist belief, for the socialist ideal that I've held close to my heart since I was a 15 year old boy. I will continue to fight till the day I die for the ideal of a society where workers own and control their own <coughs> destiny. I will fight till the day I die for a peaceful world, an end to intolerance and injustice and a world where people recognize no matter what your religion, no matter what your race, no matter what your ethnicity, we are all brothers and sisters and we all come <coughs> from the same background. It's time in 2017 we began to act <coughs> like brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters in action. If we do that, we will not only honour Salt the Gates and Orgreave, but we'll honour all those who've gone before us, yes, and died for their beliefs in the fight for a better world and a socialism that all of us, I believe, want to see in our lifetime. It's a privilege to be here.